Chapter Three of A Daughter of Today by Sarah Jeanette Duncan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Pas mal, parbleu, Lucien remarked with pursed out lips, running his fingers through his shock of coarse hair and reflectively scratching the top of his big head as he stepped closer to Nadie Palichki's elbow, where she stood at her easel in his crowded atelier the girl turned and looked keenly into his face seeking his eyes which were on her work with a considering interested look satisfied she sent a glance of joyous triumph at a somewhat older woman whose place was next and who was listening with the amiable effacement of countenance that is sometimes a more or less successful disguise for chagrin on this occasion it seemed to fail for mademoiselle politsky turned her attention to lucien and her work again with a slight raising of the eyebrows and a slighter sigh her face assumed a gentle melancholy as if she were pained at the exhibition of a weakness of her sex yet it was unnecessary to be an acute observer to read there the hope that lucien's significant phrase had not by any chance escaped her neighbor the drawing of the neck lucien went on is excellently brutal nadie wished he would speak a little louder but lucien always arranged the carrying power of his voice according to the susceptibilities of the atelier he thrust his hands into his pockets and still stood beside her looking at her study of the nude model who posed upon a table in the midst of the students in you mademoiselle he added in a tone yet lower i find the woman and the artist divorced that is a vast advantage an immense source of power i am growing more certain of you you are not merely cleverly eccentric as i thought you have a great deal that no one can teach you you have finished that i wish to take it downstairs to show to the men it will not be jeered at i promise you cher maitre you mean it but certainly the girl handed him the study with a look of almost dog-like gratitude in her narrow gray eyes lucien had never said so much to her before though the whole atelier had noticed how often he had been coming to her easel lately and had disparaged her in corners accordingly she looked at the tiny silver watch she wore in a leather strap on her left wrist he had spent nearly five minutes with her this time watching her work and talking to her in itself a triumph it was almost four o'clock and the winter daylight was going presently they would all stop work partly for the pleasure of being chaffed and envied and complimented in the ante-room in the general washing of the brushes and partly to watch lucien's rapid progress among the remaining easels mademoiselle politsky deliberately sat down in a prematurely vacant chair swung one slender little limb over the other and waited as she sat there a generous thought rose above her exultation she hoped everybody else in the atelier had guessed what lucien was saying to her all that while and had seen him carry off her day's work but not the little american the little american who was at least thirteen inches taller than mademoiselle politsky was sufficiently discouraged already and it was pathetic in view of almost a year of failure to see how she clung to her ghost of a talent besides the little american admired nadie politsky her friend her comrade quite enough already elfrida had heard nevertheless she listened eagerly tensely as she always did when lucien opened his lips in her neighbourhood when she saw him take the sketch to show in the men's atelier downstairs to exhibit to that horde of animals below whose studies and sketches and compositions were so constantly brought up for the stimulus and instruction of lucien's women students she grew suddenly so white that the girl who worked next her a straw-coloured swede asked her if she were ill and offered her a little green bottle of salts of lavender 
it's that beast of a calorifere the swede said nodding at the hideous black cylinder that stood near them they will always make it too hot elfrida waved the salts back hastily lucien was coming her way she worked seated and as he seemed on the point of passing with merely a casual glance and an ambiguous hmm she started up the movement effectually arrested him unintentional though it seemed he frowned slightly thrusting his hands deep into his coat pockets and looked again we must find a better place for you mademoiselle you can make nothing of it here so close to the model and below him thus he would have gone on but in spite of his intention to avert his eyes he caught the girl's glance and something infinitely appealing in it stayed him again mademoiselle he said with visible irritation there is nothing to say that i have not said many times already your drawing is still ladylike your colour is still pretty and sacristy you have worked with me a year still he added recollecting himself lucien never lost a student by over candour considering your difficult place the shoulders are not so bad continue mademoiselle the girl's eyes were fastened immovably upon her work as she sat down again painting rapidly in an ineffectual meaningless way with the merest touch of colour in her brush her face glowed with the deepest shame that had ever visited her lucien was scolding the swede soundly she had disappointed him he said elfrida felt heavily how impossible it was that she should disappoint him and they had all heard the english girl in the south kensington gown the rich new yorker nadie's rival the roumanian nadie herself and they were all except the last working more vigorously for hearing nadie had turned her head away and so far as the back of a neck and the tips of two ears could express oblivion of what had passed it might have been gathered from hers but elfrida knew better and she resented the pity of the pretense more than if she had met mademoiselle pelitchki's long light grey eyes full of derisive laughter for a year she had been in it and of it that intoxicating life of the quartier latin so much in it that she had gladly forgotten any former one so much of it that it had become treason to believe existence supportable under any other conditions it was her pride that she had felt everything from the beginning her instinctive apprehension of all that is to be apprehended in the passionate fantastic vivid life on the left side of the seine had been a conscious joy from the day she had taken her tiny apartment in the rue port royale and bought her colours and sketching-book from a dwarf-like little dealer in the next street who assured her proudly that he supplied henner and dagnon bouveret and moreover knew precisely what she wanted from experience moi aussi mademoiselle je suis artiste she had learnt nothing she had absorbed everything it seemed to her that she had entered into her inheritance and that in the possessions that throng the quartier latin she was born to be rich in thinking this she had an overpowering realization of the poverty of sparta so convincing that she found it unnecessary to tell herself that she would never go back there that was the unconscious pivotal supposition in everything she thought or said or did after the first bewildering day or two when the exquisite thrill of paris captured her indefinitely she felt the full tide of her life turn and flow steadily in a new direction with a delight of revelation and an ecstasy of promise that made nothing in its sweep of every emotion that had not its birth and growth in art and forbade the mere consideration of anything that might be an obstacle as if it were a sin 
she entered her new world with proud recognition of its unwritten laws its unsanctified morale its riotous overflowing ideals and she was instant in gathering that to see to comprehend these was to be thrice blessed as not to see not to comprehend them was to dwell in outer darkness with the bourgeois and the sandpaper artists and others who are without hope it gave her moments of pure delight to reflect how little the people suspected the reality of the existence of such a world notwithstanding all they read and all they professed and how absolutely exclusive it was in the very nature of nature how it had its own language untranslatable its own creed unbelievable its own customs unfathomable by outsiders and yet among the true-born how divinely simple recognition was her allegiance had the loyalty of every fibre of her being her scorn of the world she had left was too honest to permit any posing in that regard the life at sparta assumed the colours and very much the significance depicted on a bit of faded tapestry when she thought of it it was to groan that so many of her young impressionable years had been wasted there she hoarded her years now that every day and every hour was suffused with its individual pleasure or interest or that keen artistic pain which also had its value as a sensation in the quartier latin it distressed her to think that she was almost twenty-one the interminable year that intervened between elfrida's return from philadelphia and her triumph in the matter of being allowed to go to paris to study she had devoted mainly to the society of the swiss governess in the sparta seminary for young ladies methodist episcopal with the successful object of getting a working knowledge of french there had been a certain amount of young society too and one or two incipient love affairs watched with anxious interest by her father and with a harrowed conscience by her mother who knew elfrida's capacity for amusing herself and unlimited opportunities had occurred for the tacit exhibition of her superiority to sparta of which she had not always taken advantage but the significance of the year gathered into the french lessons it was by virtue of these that the time had a place in her memory mademoiselle joubert supplemented her instruction with a violent affection a great deal of her society and the most entertainingly modern of the french novels which brentano sent her monthly in enticing packets her single indulgence so that after the first confusion of a multitude of tongues in the irrelevant parisian quay elfrida found herself reasonably fluent and fairly at ease the illumined jargon of the atelier stayed with her naturally she never forgot a word or a phrase and in two months she was babbling and mocking with the rest she lived alone she learnt readily to do it on eighty francs a month and her appartement became charming in three weeks she divined what she should have there and she managed to get extraordinary bargains in mystery and history out of the dealers in such things so cracked and so rusty so moth-eaten and of such excellent colour that the escape of the combined effect from banalite was a marvel she had a short sharp struggle with her american taste for simple elegance in dress and overthrew it aiming with some success at originality instead she found it easy in paris to invest her striking personality in a distinctive costume sufficiently becoming and sufficiently odd of which a broad soft felt hat which made a delightful brigand of her and a hungarian cloak formed important features 
the hungarian cloak suited her so extremely well that artistic considerations compelled her to wear it occasionally i fear when other people would have found it uncomfortably warm in nothing that she said or did admired or condemned was there any trace of the commonplace except perhaps the desire to avoid it it had become her conviction that she owed this to herself she was thoroughly popular in the atelier her petits soupers were so good her enthusiasms so generous her drawing so bad the other pupils declared that she had a head divinement tragique and for those of them she liked she sometimes posed filling impressive parts in their weekly compositions they all knew the little apartment in the rue port royale more or less well according to the favor with which they were received nadi palichki perhaps knew it best nadi palichki and her friend monsieur andre vambery who always accompanied her when she came to elfrida's in the evening finding it impossible to allow her to be out alone at night which nadi confessed agreeable to her vanity but a bore elfrida found it difficult in the beginning to admire the friend he was too small for dignity and mademoiselle palichki's inspired comparison of his long black hair to serpent noir left her unimpressed moreover she thought she detected about him a personal odor which was neither that of sanctity nor any other abstraction it took time and conversation and some acquaintance with values as they obtain at the ecole des beaux-arts and the knowledge of what it meant to be selling to lift monsieur vambery to his proper place in her regard after that she blushed that he had ever held any other but from the first elfrida had been conscious of a kind of pride in her unshrinking acceptance of the situation she and nadie had exchanged a pledge of some sort when mademoiselle palichki bethought herself of the unconfessed fact she gave elfrida a narrow look and then leant back in her low chair and bent an imperturbable gaze upon the slender spiral of the smoke that rose from the end of her cigarette it is necessary now that you should know petite nobody else does lucien would be sure to make a fuss but i have a lover and we have decided about marriage that it is ridiculous it is a brave homme you ought to know andre but if it makes any difference elfrida reflected afterwards with satisfaction that she had not even changed colour though she had found the communication electric it seemed to her that there had been something dignified noble almost in the answer she had made with a smile that acknowledged the fact that the world had scruples on such accounts as these cela m'est absolument égal so far as the life went it was perfect the quartier spoke and her soul answered it and the world had nothing to compare with a conversation like that but the question of production of achievement was beginning to bring her moments when she had a terrible sensation that the temperature of her passion was chilled she had not yet seen despair but she had now and then lost her hold of herself and she had made acquaintance with fear there had been no vivid realization of failure but a problem was beginning to form in her mind and with it a distinct terror of the solution which sometimes found a shape in her dreams in waking voluntary moments she would see her problem only as an unanswerable enigma yet in the beginning she had felt a splendid confidence her appropriation of theory had been so brilliant and so rapid her instinctive appreciation had helped itself out so well with the casual formulas of the schools she seemed 
to herself to have an absolute understanding of expression she held her social place among the others by her power of perception and that with the completeness of her repudiation of the bourgeois had given her nadi palichki whom the rest found difficult variable unreasonable elfrida was certain that if she might only talk to lucien she could persuade him of a great deal about her talent that escaped him she was sure it escaped him in the mere examination of her work it chafed her always that her personality could not touch the master that she must day after day be only the dumb submissive pupil she felt sometimes that there were things she might say to lucien which would be interesting and valuable for him to hear lucien was always noncommittal for the first few months everybody said so and it was natural enough elfrida set her teeth against his silences his casual looks and ambiguous encouragements for a length of time which did infinite credit to her determination she felt herself capable of an eternity of pain she was proudly conscious of a willingness to oppose herself to innumerable discouragements to back her talent as it were against all odds that was historic dignified to be expected but in the inmost privacy of her soul she had conceived the character of the obstacles she was prepared to face and the list resolutely excluded any idea that it might not be worth while indifference and contempt cut at the very roots of her pledges to herself as she sat listening on this afternoon to the vivid terms of lucien's disapproval of what the swede had done she had a sharp consciousness of this severance she had nothing to say to any one in the general babble of the anteroom and nobody noticed her white face and resolute eyes particularly the americans were always so pale and so exalté nadie kept away from her elfrida had to cross the room and bring her with a little touch of angry assertion upon the arm from the middle of the group she had drawn around her on purpose as her friend knew i want you to dine with me really dine she said and her voice was both eager and repressed we will go to babaudin's one gets an excellent haricot there and you shall have that little white cheese that you love come i want you particularly i will even make him bring champagne anything nadie gave her a quick look and made a little theatrical gesture of delight quel bonheur she cried for the benefit of the others and then in a lower tone but not babaudin's petite andre will not permit babaudin's he says it is not convenable and she threw up her eyes with mock resignation say papos they keep their feet off the table at papos there are fewer of those bêtes des anglais papos is cheaper elfrida returned darkly the few english who dine at babaudin's behave perfectly well i will not be insulted about the cost i'll be answerable to andre you don't lie as a general thing and why now i can afford it truly you need not be distressed mademoiselle Polichki looked into the girl's tense face for an instant and laughed a gay assent but to herself she said as she finished drying her brushes on an inconceivably dirty bit of cotton she has found herself out she has come to the truth she has discovered that it is not in her and she is coming to me for corroboration well i will not give it me it is extremely disagreeable and i have not the courage pourquoi donc i will send her to monsieur john kendall she may make him responsible he will break her but he will not lie to her they sacrifice all to their consciences those english and now you good-natured fool you are in for a devil of an evening
End of chapter 3